This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights, where we bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today, we welcome Isaac Zablocki, co-founder and New York director of the Real Abilities Film Festival. He's here to discuss the mission and goals of the festival and the importance of equity in arts and media, and to share information for the upcoming New York events. Hi, Isaac, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And so let's start off by talking a little bit about you, your work at Real Abilities. Um, thank you. Thank you. Starting with the important stuff. Yes. Um, so I've run the uh, film center at the Merlene Myers and JCC Manhattan um, for now, I think, uh, 18 years. And um our program there was always to find films that aren't being um, represented enough in our society that are important for people to see and are possibly just not not getting the right screens and um, something that we feel that our community, um, which is the New York community at large, might be or should be more interested in. And I was lucky enough, uh, I guess, 16 years ago to um run into my co-founder, um, Anita Altman, at a comedy club one night. And um, we had been working on uh, on some disability films at the JCC. And um, um, uh, we came up with this uh, wonderful plan to start a disability film festival, not knowing what it means, not knowing and really understanding um, you know, how complex the picture really is. All we know was that these films were not being shown enough and these were messages that we wanted to share, and this was an element in our society that we wanted to change. Um, I personally have a learning disability, and um, and that wasn't even a part of my process. I also, of course, have family members with disabilities, and 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 this wasn't about me. This was about like you know, here are films that need to be seen, and here's a part of the industry that needs to change. Um, and uh, we dove in, and now I'm. Uh, 15, our 15th annual festival is running uh, April 27th till May 3rd here in New York. And it's become the largest disability film festival in the country. And we're experiencing, as we've watched this evolution over these 15 years, really experiencing um, a real revolution um, that's going on within disability representation in film and media. And, you know, I find it interesting that you say, you know, you that it isn't necessarily about you. However, your experience, right, and whether or not we see ourselves on the screen, right, whether it's in uh, movies or media, um, or hear stories that resonate with us, it really does become about all of us, right? Like, how are we? How are we, we representing? Um, you know, whether it is a disability or any other story, if it's if it's not reaching the right audiences, then um, then we're not getting the message across. So thank you so much for sharing that about yourself and about real abilities. And um, so we're talking about how it's you know grown to now include an international program. I had a, a great conversation with your international rep a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so when we talk about moving this and not even moving it, but expanding it from New York to an international program. Can we talk about how that happened? Like how it went from multiple cities in the country to now spanning the globe and um, how did that development go? Um, it was, I have to say, really organic. Like we did not set out a plan for global <laughs> um, uh, um, um, takeover or anything like that. Um, we really were running a festival for our community that clearly resonated universally, and the demand came to us. And we, we of course, didn't say no and tried to keep up with the demand, but honestly, we can't. And uh, we need to invest more in keeping up with this demand and um, growing it um, um, uh, universally and and and, and even nationally. Um, what happens is is that you know some some uh, other cities came to us saying, "Oh, real abilities, that's great. We want to do that. Share your film, share your program, teach us what you know." And we just we did just that, and we had to even like kind of establish what our core um, uh, goals and um, uh, and and all of the what we stand for really what 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 we're all about. 
and um, and found that we had a really good working um, uh, program that uh, that we were able to share and able to multiply pretty easily. That's one of the nice things about film is that it can be presented in so many different places at the same time, at different times, but with greater ease. It's not like um, like a theater piece that you would need to like recreate the set and bring in the cast and everything else. Um, here we just send the files over. Um, but we really we, we we knew that we wanted to make sure that all all cities um, kept the tone of uh, real abilities by having high quality films, by um, having um, high quality of accessibility, raising the bar on accessibility, um, by following every film with a conversation. So it's not just, you know, we're showing the film, check that box, but actually engaging the community. Um, and of course, also just in um, uh, making sure that we're including partnerships. So it's not just coming from one side of the community, but it's actually a joint effort of different organizations within the community. And that's something that's been at our core from the beginning. And um, and one after another, different uh, cities started getting on board and um, uh, had some um, early efforts to kind of like bring on and train some cities. But it's kind of like the a franchise model that each city runs independently um, and just follows kind of, you know, our structures and uses our films. But we also know that every city is different and not every city is New York. And um, we love a certain kind of film, but uh, other cities might want other films and there might be a film about... I don't know about Pittsburgh that uh, that we didn't include because it didn't resonate as much. So we allow the other cities to also build their own identities and include twenty percent films that aren't from our New York um, uh, New York films, and um, and and have each each city also like not you know we could be like really there's different franchises that work in different ways. Some are extremely strict. You know you got to wear the same exact. Um, uh, exact um, uh, um, costume or, or whatever it is. Um, but we're we're kind of one that knows that every city needs to really build its own identity and just needs to follow some basics that will that, that I think we can all agree on. So um, it's been working really nicely for us and we're we're excited to try to find ways to expand it further. I think that's great. And allowing for the cities to include uh, 20% of of films that maybe are working for their community, it just it brings the message home, and I think that's such a smart way to to go about it. Um, and of course, you know, following your form, I mean, there's there's such great branding to begin with with real abilities, and I think it's it's really um, something that when you see it now, you know what it is, and it and more people becoming exposed to it is. Um, is definitely great. And so let's let's talk about the cities themselves. Can you list off some of the ones that are here, but also some that are uh, not in this country? Um, so we're in a lot of the major cities, and I have to admit that even cities that we're not in at the moment, we've been in in the past. You know, not every city can you know keep a Real Abilities Film Festival running every year. And we've been running internationally for, I'd say, I think it's since year five. So it's probably for 10 years now. And, you know, like, unfortunately, Boston came and had a really strong festival. And I think whatever happened that it's not running there anymore. Um, but we keep getting demand to bring it back to Boston. Um, so there's a lot of cities where we've been. And I'd say we've been to many of the major cities throughout the U.S., um, I believe in way over 20 cities throughout the U.S. Um, L.A., Houston, um, Pittsburgh was, are, are some of like, you know, our um, staple festivals that have uh, really strong followings. Um, and many more. I don't want to leave any out because uh, really a lot of festivals have been around and doing amazing work um, um, uh, for a while. Northern Virginia has a great one that we've um, been working with since the early days. Um, but it's expanded into Canada as well. That was an easy expansion to some degree. Um, the more complicated one is uh, Mexico City, and we've been in other cities in, in uh, Latin America. And there, of course, we need to create new accessibility for all the films because um, those films are, are, are we, the accessibility that we have is in English. Um, and it was up to those cities to really create those. And they were engaged enough to do the work. And, and that is so cool in and of itself. We've had the opportunity to produce some videos here where we've had um, fully immersive 
languages that were not English and creating accessibility around that was um, was really eye-opening in so many ways for something new for us to do and really look at how we can bring accessibility um, into non-English speaking arenas, which um, then we've been able to share with other people as well. So um, I would love to see some of the stuff that's going on um, in other languages because it is it is uh, an education in and of itself to look at accessibility from uh, not just the English speaking standpoint. Um, and so before we talk about the other things that happen within the festival, uh, let me ask you, what are your thoughts on, um, on how accessibility and uh, movies about people with disabilities have also taken um, a, a different, have brought a light, uh, there's been a light shining on them. I think about CODA, of course, and um, and having, uh, you know, award-winning actors uh, who were speaking sign language. What are your thoughts on how mainstream is bringing accessibility and bringing awareness to uh, disability uh, as well as accessibility um, and how it's, you know, here we are in 2023 and this is one of the first times that we've seen this. I think Marley Matlin was, um, was it 1989 maybe? Um, so what are your thoughts on that and, and how we've progressed uh, over the years when it comes to disability related, um, and I shouldn't even say disability related movies, right? Because the movie was about life. And it just so happened that the family um, was mostly uh, not speaking English. They're speaking ASL. But talk a little bit about that. That I mean, there's a, there's a lot there. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, those are my favorite kind of films for real abilities, which are ones that are not about the disability. Sure, some sometimes it's about the disability, but um, I like the ones that are about a family and they just happen to have a disability or happen to be disabled or happen to have um, some differences, which is, uh, is I think, what makes a good story um, right. and, and usually has, uh, you know, so it gives you rich material. Um, of course, Hollywood has not been great for disability, but I, as I mentioned before, and as you're pointing out here, we're experiencing what we think is a revolution in terms of disability inclusion. Um, this is, of course, a disability rights movement has been um, you know, fighting for this for so many years. And um, film, I think, is part of the the legal changes that has happened. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, but it's now about the cultural change. And that's really where, where I think Hollywood plays a big part. And Hollywood has been behind, um, has been uh, um, not giving always the best representation, if any representation at all. Um, often the stories were told from outside and not from within. Um, uh, the casting would be inauthentic. And that means that no actors with disabilities were really, even when there was a disabled role, um, they weren't given the, op given the opportunities. Um, that is, I, I also give credit here to all the diversity and inclusion efforts that are going on in our world right now or in America right now in terms of really changing the dial and saying, okay, you know, this is, um, you know, inauthentic casting is unacceptable. Um, I, by the way, I, I think there's always gray. I'm not a black and white person. I think that there's, there's always room and understanding for like, you know, right. Sometimes there is a role, you know, there's a role of a certain child with a rare disability that you might not be able to cast exactly, um, the way, the way you would think that it should be. Um, but I think having the right efforts and showing signs of inclusion and making sure that you're really making a statement of inclusion is something that the disability community has been extremely overlooked for over years, over decades. And um, now we're finally seeing um, uh, some attention. I think uh, um, even everything everywhere all at once this year's film, I think there's, uh, I would say there's a neurodivergent um, um, representation there. And oh, absolutely. And yeah, and it's it's another sign of like, you know, the diversity efforts that Hollywood is making. And and let's just say, you know, I think it's really it's really strange that we give out awards to films. I heard this recently on a podcast <laughs> that 
you're judging art. Oh, this one is better than this. Oh, Picasso is better than Van Gogh. I don't, you can't say that one's better than the other. Um, what is clear is that we're making statements of what our society is trying to elevate and to shine a spotlight on. And um, and clearly that level of diversity is something that um, that is important to our society. And we realize really the statement that this makes for our community. And this is why we have to have to go and see these kinds of films and make sure these films are seen by other people. Um, and just going back to your earlier point for a moment on um, uh, on the international level of, uh, for the, first of all, I think film is often a universal language, but it's really fascinating to see where America is in terms of access and to many countries, oh, America is the golden standard. Um, the ADA has influenced so many other countries. Um, of course, we are always looking. I, I'm I'm always seeing. I don't know what's going on. I don't know every detail. I don't get into the into the um, legal side of things. But um, but Australia, for instance, I'm always seeing these wonderful examples. Of course, in many countries where there's government support. Um, for the arts, You're, I'm seeing so much more being done in terms of disability inclusion than when what we get here in America, where there's very limited, um, uh, um, um, you know, government funding for the arts, and uh, and and I, I think people don't realize like just really how diverse this world is of disability, and how when you throw in that also the elements of other cultures and other languages. How there's no one ASL, you know, American Sign Language, obviously, is just for America. Even in England, they don't speak, they don't use ASL. There's, there's their own version of it. Um, so um, it's really a very complex and very diverse community that uh, it's, it's kind of beautiful to make these efforts to bring it together. Absolutely. And it, it goes to the education of the part of the audience that is not aware. And um, unless you've had someone in your family who's experienced something, I mean, we say a lot here, if you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. And we could take that even further to say, if you've met one person, really, you've met one person. I mean, we all have unique characteristics. And also, you know, the when we're talking about uh, community, of people with disabilities, there's, it's such a vast community. Um, and, and to your point about sign languages, uh, it's, that is something that I didn't realize was not um, common knowledge. And I even say the words common knowledge, and I think I don't even know what that means <laughs> anymore. But um, how many sign languages there are, and then also that uh, closed captioning is not the same, that it's it's literally a different language. And so being able to educate with film is something that has been happening for a really long time. Um, and to be able to educate on um, you know uh, subjects that people aren't necessarily familiar with if they haven't had an experience is just... I mean, that is what art is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to inform us. It's supposed to uh, show us a, a different perspective. So, you know, just one more reason why I really appreciate and I'm so excited about um, this festival. I'm going to get to go this year. So I am very excited to go um, and, and see the films as well. Um, as we talk about the festival, you don't just showcase films. Um, this is the platform, you know, creatives and other art forms. There's dance, uh, live music, comedy, exhibitions, and, and a lot more. Let's talk about how this uh, real ability is, you know, is not just film and how it has really also included a diverse group of art and artists. Yeah, I mean, there was always that, from the very beginning, there was that demand to not just do film, but to really to have other events and to allow this to be a celebration of disabilities. We are at our core of film festival, but um, but making room for to highlight other, other, um, uh, other art forms was something that we always wanted to do. And yes, as you were putting it, art is just such a great way to express the human experience and to share if it's if it's a painting, if it's um, a dance, if it's a um, if it's whatever piece of art it might be, um, film especially, you're getting a window into someone else's soul, and it's it's a 
it's a fascinating way to experience and to connect because as you were saying before, yes, everybody's experience is different, but also everybody's human and we, we, we can relate and yet have differences at the same time. And uh, this is just part of that grayness of our, of our existence. Um, this year's festival, we have a lot of exciting events going on and we're really excited. We're, we're excited to get back in person um, which we did last year too. We were hybrid um, and we're keeping that hybrid because of accessibility purposes. We want to make sure that everyone in our community could access and feel safe in accessing. So we're making sure to keep things virtual as well, but um, but also um, an emphasis on having that in-person experience too. And, um, and, and bringing back also all those other art forms. And I, I'm, I'm, Got to give credit here to the Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment who have partnered with us for many years. And this year, last year, we started a um, accessibility summit for the industry where we talked about how to better accessibility in the film industry. And they came to us this year, the Mayor's Office, and said, can you expand that to include all performing arts. So we're going um, beyond film and you don't say no to the mayor's office, right? <laughs> um, who knows what will happen? And uh, we're, we're, we were excited to to take this on and really um, share all um, arts um, and talk about accessibility within theater, within dance, within um, performing arts, as well as film, of course. Um, I'm also, one of the things I'm most excited about is our comedy night, which has always been a big hit. Um, all disabled performers. And this year we're doing, sometimes we did just like stand up, but this year we're doing a variety show. I feel like we're a little bit of like Saturday Night Live. We're going to show clips. We're going to have uh, stand up. We're going to have um, some sketch comedy. We're going to have some improv. Um, and it's going to be an amazing night at the Gotham Comedy Club. So like at a quality location that really stands for, um, has the, the stamp of, of good comedy. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's another big highlight for me. That's fantastic. I can't wait to go see all of those shows too. I hope that I'm going to be able to get to as many of these as possible. I mean, and we talk about in-person and hybrid and how, so much has changed, right, with uh, with lockdown and COVID and how we are really looking at accessibility on a global, a global view because we had to, right? We had to figure out how can um, several industries continue um, without leaving our homes. So when I think about how this has impacted audiences, right, we're we're able to reach so many more people because we now have these other platforms. And while there's no uh, there's no substitute for um, doing something in person necessarily. Like if you want to see something live, it's you're going to have to be there. But how has really Zoom and having um, having digital content, being able to be remote, how has that impacted the festival? I mean, as you said, you were back in person last year, hybrid anyway, but are you seeing that your audience numbers are growing uh, based on having the availability of uh, accessing through uh, digital content or remote viewing? Um, and is there is there a plan to maybe expand the digital end of it um, in the same way that you are the live. Uh, and, and that's, that's, I think it usually those things will happen hand in hand, but I, I just feel like it's been such a game changer for audience development, right? We can reach more people. How's that impacted the festival itself? Yeah, um, it, it's something that's it's had a deep impact on us. First of all, our first virtual festival, we had planned for an in-person festival um, for the end of March 2020. If you remember March 2020, <laughs> uh, March 11th, I believe uh, the, the the lockdown began. And um, we had to actually change things. I mean, nobody knew what this all meant, but um, we went virtual within two weeks and um, ran, the, it, it was kind of also like, piecemeal and we put all these like elements together but we made it happen and um it was our most successful festival to date and it's not just about um 
ticket sales. It's about actually people writing to us emails saying, I've wanted to attend the festival for years. We would run our festival, not just our main location is the JCC here in Manhattan, um, but to be more accessible, we ran in all five boroughs, including Staten Island, and nobody ever runs in Staten Island. Um, we ran in Long Island, Westchester. We one year were in like over 40 locations. And this was to be accessible. And of course, still we were not fully accessible until we went uh, and became virtual. And we got all this loving mail from people saying that um, emails saying that um that they were able to attend the festival and access the festival for the first time. And that's something that we want to keep. And we're keeping it this year, of course, as long as we can. There's going to be, I'm sure, like, you know, the culture is going to change a little bit. And um, people are, I, I, I'm already seeing kind of like less attendance virtually, more attendance in person, and kind of uh, those, uh, I see that from other festivals, and and kind of those numbers uh, switching off in terms of where, where people are going to attend. Um, there's also going to be um, the films themselves, some films, we have one short film this year that decided that it doesn't want to be virtually accessible. Um, which is something that we're um, we are of course respectful of, and um, and I think that's going to grow over time. Um, but it's it's another form of accessibility. We want to keep um, this year. We want to make sure that that a vulnerable community stays safe and therefore can, does not have to come out if it doesn't choose to and can watch these these films at home. Um, having that available on having all of our conversations available uh, both via Zoom and on our YouTube channel is really so crucial. Um, but the most important thing is we've been talking about this for many years, and finally we've put the, gotten the resources together, and have uh, we're launching a a streaming site for all of our past films. We have we're going to have this year now 15 years of past films that um, many of them you know, that can't be, weren't shown outside of real abilities. And these are fabulous films that, uh, that need to be shown and need to be out there. So um, we're, we're going to be launching a streaming site for past films. How cool is that? Well, we will have to put that information in the notes of the podcast as well. I am excited to see the past 15 years as well. Um, and that's so exciting. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And so one of the things that, you know, we're, this is on the heels of is we're talking about inclusivity, right? Intersectionality and accessibility uh, within the disability community. It's part of your mission. Um, it's part of ensuring that all of these things are part of uh, arts and media. Um, and as you said, now the, the mayor's office is also interested in this across platforms within, um, within the arts. Talk about why this is so important. I mean, we're talking about virtual versus live for health reasons for certain people. Um, but when we talk about equity and we talk about representation um, and how inclusivity and intersectionality really is part is fundamentally part of the art landscape, um, if you will, that um, how is it that bringing all of those things together for real abilities um, is so crucial to the to the mission. Talk about why that is part of uh, your mission as as written. So, so I, I don't think it's actually it's, it's crucial for real abilities, but it's obviously crucial to trickle down everywhere else for our society. Um, people with disabilities, as you know, make up um, as depending on where you're reading your numbers, you know, 15 to 25 percent of uh, of America and of the world. Um, and this is the largest minority population. And there are so many stigmas um, about this community. Um, there are there's so much, um, uh, I think, fear. Um, it is within the workplace. Um, I'm, I'm constantly seeing this is these are not re, um, real numbers. This is what I'm hearing just from every partner I speak to that less than 2% of every um, company that we're involved with um, has disability representation, 2%. And, um, and I think that the numbers are higher. I think people with disabilities are having trouble self-identifying and and coming out with their disability because of the stigmas that are related to disability. They fear that, you know, they might not get hired. They might not be able to keep their job. They might be treated differently. And um, and and I think I think we just say disability is still different for people. And I think we need to make it the norm. And that's something that real abilities tries to do by having this just be a normal part 
of our daily life and inclusion and differences, as you said before, everybody's different. Every human is <laughs> is different. I mean, I I, I fall into the um, uh, neurodivergent category now, and I'm like, everybody's neurodivergent. Everyone has a different brain. Sure, mine might, you know, and whatever standardized tests, mine uh, might work a little bit differently, but um, th th then whatever number allows you to create a big number. And maybe that's what's something that I'm just thinking about this for the first time, that maybe society really wants to create like, you know, this, this similarity between all of us. Oh, we're the same. We behave a certain way. We vote a certain way. We eat a certain way. When in truth is, is like, you know, I think we need to try to, to actually make room for the individuality and make room for the differences and make room for understanding that everybody's different and respecting that, that that shouldn't be a problem if one kid wants to learn in a class by standing up while everybody else is sitting down. Um, so, so that's something that that I feel that real abilities is helping change society, change the way we view disability, change the way disability is represented. We've always shown a progressive kind of vision of disability. And, and and look for ways to, even within our program and with our representation, to really um, highlight that celebration of difference. I agree with you. And, you know, as we, you know, use the word, like how we view or the vision of, really, when we're talking about how disability or any difference is, um, is typical within a group is by visibility, right? I mean, unless we see each other uh, and see the differences, the different groups of people represented, whether it's in uh, arts and media or in our government or um, in our workplace or even in our families, really, you know, we're, if we don't see other people, if we don't have the experience of uh, different experiences with other people, then we're not going to have the ability to even um, to know about a difference or to know that it is not something that, you know, there should be no fear around it. Um, but we can't do that if we're not, if we're not seeing representation and, you know, thinking of, especially as we grow up, um, if we're not seeing ourselves represented, whether it's in media, you know, or our ads or different types of clothing availability, um, then we're not going to know that we are part of this greater group of uh, people who get to be part of a community, right? So it's whether it's we do things together or similarly or not, we will always be part of uh, a community and, and that um, assists with that. So um, this is such a great conversation. I'm so glad we, we get to talk before <laughs> the festival. Um, and, and I, I want to say to that, that it's, that it's, it's both, I mean, and the festival tries to be both for insiders, you know, see myself on the screen, um, right. but also for outsiders and, you know, have somebody see somebody that they don't see on their screen. Of course, I believe everybody's connected to disabilities somewhere, somehow. And if not, it's as, as they say, it's the only um, 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 minority group that anyone can join. And most of us will eventually. Um, disability is there and let's, let's not shy away from it. Let's not hide from it. It, it amazes me. I, I always say this, that, um, even in our progressive New York community, this is a minority that people are are so afraid of, and and people will come over to me and say to me like you know you know very progressive people who who say then you know oh disability scares me I I don't do it I'm grossed out by it I'm like please I like cover my ears and <laughs> tell them like you know you know would you say that about any other minority population and why is this allowed why is this okay and, and of course of course you know it gets worse when you have that that's exactly where like then then bullying stems from and 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 of course worse things happen and um there's actual exclusion um because of uh, of an attitude this negative attitude towards disability which is just there's no room for it anymore no there really isn't and um and so and so now let's talk a little bit about the the real nuts and bolts of accessibility of the festival right so what types of accessibility will be available for the festival? And are these um, accessibility features uh, that will be at every festival? As you said, you know, there it's uh, 
a little bit more loose than a full-on franchise where everyone's wearing the same uniform, but um, are all of these accessibility um, options and features within the, the festival, are they across all of the festivals that happen no matter where they are? So the general ones are, of course, everybody brings their own flavor to it. Accessibility also has grown into, it's become my little obsession of like seeing, like learning more and seeing what can be done. And and, and you realize that um, accessibility sometimes can be have uh, conflicts and contrasts. So what works for one community is actually exclusionary for another community. And, and that's part of, you know, finding the individuality and setting certain standards but uh, I'll say that, first of all, all Real Abilities films are um, shown with open captions, meaning it's not captions that you could turn on and off. They are burnt onto the film. We are proud to have them there. We work on them in unique ways and um, try to make them as as enjoyable and not for some, you know, some people turn off the captions when they see when they when they get on their TV and somehow the captions are on. I'm somebody who turns them on, of course, and a lot of people who even don't have hearing loss might uh, might turn on the captions because that's the way they want to watch their their TV. We try to make it in a way that it doesn't interfere and yet gives everybody the full experience. We create audio description for absolutely every film. We, of course, show in accessible spaces and look for, for venues that are the most accessible um, and try to make as much space as possible. I mean, we have we have this problem, which I love. I love it when we have wheelchair traffic jams. That's a, a beautiful sign of success for me. I mean, we don't like the traffic jam, but um, sometimes for some screenings, we'll have so many wheelchair users that, um, you know, it, it clogs up the space. And luckily, the space here at the JCC has room for, for an ample amount of wheelchair users. And that's something that not every movie theater, actually, most movies, we've looked for others and most movie theaters do not have. So, so we're, we're, that's, that's another form of, of uh, accessibility. We, we like, one thing that we started doing last year was having an accessibility table, a table. So what do you need? How can we help you? How can we take you? How can we help you run something? I mean, sometimes accessibility even just goes beyond um, actually a disability, but really just giving access to anyone who needs, who needs service. And we'll have uh, volunteers and trained uh, individuals to really um, help anyone with their individual needs that might uh, that might come up. Um, it could be, you know, some years we we give the accessibility devices, but a person doesn't know how to use them. Um, so we want to give more attention to to all of that. We want to create spaces. So if somebody needs a break, if somebody needs um, need, needs uh, is feeling is feeling triggered in any way by a film, by the experience, to have a space to be able to feel comfortable, um, we want to make sure that that's there for everybody. And we're always looking for new ways and constantly learning. I'll, I'll say we're constantly saying, "Oh wait, this can work better. This can work differently. This can um, maybe be more accessible." And we know that we're never perfect. Um, in terms of other locations, I mean, we, we try to create that basic standard, teach them everything that we know and that we're learning. Um, but know that, of course, um, not everybody um, can necessarily keep or have the culture to really have that same standard. But uh, in general, to have an inclusive space that um, is, is looking to to find ways to best include everybody, um, that's, I think, the, the right, that's the spirit of the festival. That's fantastic. And I love that you have a table to whether it's get suggestions or or really get lived experience um, from someone to say, hey, this is something that I am having difficulty with or need assistance with while I'm here, um, because that will evolve accessibility. Go ahead. For sure. Um, I, I, this year for the first time, here's I, I love sharing like new ones that we're doing. So we're going to have um, uh, um, for people who might not be able to communicate verbally, um, we're going to have images that can be pointed to that we can share if this will help both both um, if we're communicating with somebody who can't hear um, and with people who might might just respond better, better visually and have um, um, visual communication keys that we can uh, use to help communicate. And um, this was, this was a, a new one for this year and a, a new way for us to um, raise that bar. Again, so cool. And I would love to talk to you again after the festival so we can see how some of these things worked in action um, and show the rest of our audience what what it is that's available. Um, as soon as you know, we we know of something that can be helpful to someone. If we can um, 
really push it out there and say this is something that we could all be uh, doing. Um, I would love to see that in action. So of course now I'm now I'm saying to you, you know, I need to have you come back and show us. Um, and if you have, I'll be uh, there. Yes. And so one thing that you talked about that I don't know that everyone in our audience knows about, and actually something that um, that we talk about here are audio descriptions. And I often get the question, you know, why are they important? Like, um, and doesn't that make for, you know, a lot of words at the bottom of the film or whatever? Talk a little bit about audio descriptions and why they're so important when we talk about accessibility. So audio description is mainly for the uh, blind community and for um, the vision loss community to um, be able to enjoy the films as well and gives a, a it, it's funny because it's, we say audio description, so you immediately think it's for the deaf community, but it's actually for the blind community because it gives an, an audible um, uh, description of the visuals on the screen. Um, so you get a little headpiece. It's actually, we're going to use also a system this year where you can download an app and, um, and, and get access to listen on your own device if you don't want to use uh, the devices that we have available and you you get to to follow the um the the, the film with audio description that's not intrusive there, there's one festival out there and i've gone to a few screenings and we've even done one screening where the audio description was um was live and we had it we had it available so everybody watched the film with audio description through the speakers um, it's lovely. It's a lovely experiment. Um, it's not for everybody. Most most people, uh, it's hard for them to follow with the audio description. It creates distractions for a lot of people. Um, it's often a lot too. You're right. There's there's a lot of you know to describe. I, I watched one audio description on Netflix once, and it was the laziest <laughs> description I've ever seen. It was like a man entered the room. And that's all you got. That, that, that was it till like, you know, like, you know, 15 minutes later, they gave something else. And I was like, this is it. This is your audio description. Um, <laughs> our audio description, you know, there's a script that's written that, like, you know, that, that it's an art form and it has to fit in in between dialogue because you have to be able to hear the dialogue. We also do it for our foreign films where the dialogue is not in English. So the describers need to actually give us the type, the subtitles, the tran the translation as well. And this gives you even less space and creates, you know, there's a lot of material there. And I am in awe of the, uh, of the, the, the audio describers who, who managed to like put it all together and are tech people who, who edit it into one file that like, you know, stands there. Um, and so this is an, another amazing thing is that like technology has come a long way at the beginning days of real abilities. The only way for us to provide audio description was we had a countdown on the visual and on the audio description that we would need to align. And um, that way we would know that the audio for the audio description, which played completely separately on a different device, um, was was aligned with the film itself. Of course, if this gets set off by even a few frames, it uh, creates you know total chaos and can ruin a movie. So now technology actually allows us to put it into different tracks and um, gets a little bit easier. And I'm I'm glad uh, that we're done with those days. Again, so cool, and and I would love to to uh, see some of that. And now I've taken up just about all of our time asking a bunch of questions that um, I was really interested in for our audience. But I should really ask you about the event that's coming up. We'll put all of the information in our notes. But let's talk about when is this year's event, um, and when will tickets be available, and. Um, and yeah, so timeline, where are we right now? I'll, I'll give you it all. So um, Real Abilities is running April 27th till May 3rd. Um, tickets are on sale now. Um, we're going to be both in-person and virtual. In-person in 11 locations, all five boroughs and beyond. Um, we are showing all the films at the Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan on the Upper West Side. But um, I think all films, if not almost all films, are repeated in another location as well and available virtually as well. Um, all with full accessibility. Tickets are on sale. Um, you go to realabilities.org um, slash New York. We have other cities, so you want to make sure to go to the New York site and you can get your tickets right now. Um, please tell all your friends. That's the most important thing. Um, don't just go come alone. Um, bring a friend. Bring 10 friends. This is one of those festivals that uh, that needs your support in, in really getting the word out there. 
and um, we 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 have diverse films. It's not just like you know, oh, here's what we could have made a film festival just on one disability. Um, we try to include as many disabilities as possible. We try to include as many different types of stories as possible. Um, so there's there, there's really something for absolutely everyone there. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but as we talk about, uh, I'm sure you can't say you have a favorite film, but is there one that you would want to highlight and is maybe something a little different that uh, than you've seen before um, it, before we sign off today? So it's always good. I love to highlight the short films. I don't know if that's included as one or that's actually our majority of films. Short films get overlooked and there in our short film compilations, you get the most diversity because you see different stories and they're often, I think, you know, they push the envelope the most. It's like, you know, the, it's those daring young filmmakers who don't necessarily have the budget for a feature film um, who make those short films that are really kind of revolutionary. And, um, and, and I, and I think sometimes um, the quality is of the high is higher than anything else. Cause uh, they really put a lot of effort into those, you know, 10 minutes and it's, it's really um, beautiful stories. So, um, we have, I think, five compilations of uh, of short films, and um, so many. And, and unfortunately, like there are so many more great films, and we just couldn't include them all. But uh, but but that's something that kind of gets overlooked and should be looked at a little more. Well, thank you so much. I cannot wait to come to the festival. Maybe we will meet in person when I'm down there. Um, but again, thank you so much. I can't wait to have you back after the festival to talk a little bit more about it. Um, and we'll put all of the information on where to get tickets, all of your social media in the notes of our uh, podcast today. With pleasure. And uh, please say hi if you come to the festival. Empire State of Rights has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. The video for this episode is available on our YouTube channel with closed captioning and ASL interpretation. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. For more Empire State of Rights, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube.